Hello, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Sigurd Quack, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of SASI to end this year's virtual organizers, the KAK, Center for Global Cooperation Research, the Institute for Work, Skills, and Training, and the Deutsches Institut for Interdisciplinary Sozialpolitik, all at the University of Duisburg Essen. We are extremely pleased that Professor Jane, many know you as Jenny, Mansbridge is with us today as featured speaker to present her thoughts on our democracies too weak to bear our burdens. Jenny Mansbridge is the Charles F. Adams Professor Emerita of Political Leadership and Democratic Values at the Harvard Kennedy School. In recognition of her outstanding scholarship, Jenny Mansbridge received the International Joanne Skite Prize in 2018, the foremost award in the field of political science. Jenny has published widely, including several influential books, just to mention two, Beyond Adversary Democracy, an empirical and normative study of face-to-face -face democracy, and the prize winning Why We Lost the ERR, a study of anti deliberative dynamics and social movements based on organizing for an equal rights amendment to the US Constitution. Among her most cited publications is the article on Should Blacks Represent Blacks and Women Represent Women? A Contingent Yes, Journal of Politics. In 2014, as president of the American Political Science Association, she led a task force that produced a book-length report on negotiating agreement in politics. She is also co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Deliberative Democracy. John, Jenny's current work focuses on representation, democratic deliberation, everyday activism, and public understanding of free wider problems. We are very proud of Jenny Mansbridge, a SASI honorary fellow and past president of SASI, because her work stands out for the ways in which she bridges normative thought and empirical analysis. Throughout her career, she has been an engaged academic, driven by a sense of social justice addressing real world problems as a research and as a public, public intellectual. So that is why we are very happy to have you here today, Jenny. Here's how we will proceed. After Jenny's lecture, there will be time for a short Q&A. Please feel free to send your questions and comments during and after the lecture through the Q&A, and, and I will then read them out. Since Jenny's connection is not perfect, we have decided that uh, Pat will present the slides and Jenny will try to direct her as much as possible. So please uh, be understanding if here and there we might have a slight delay in the coordination of what Jenny is saying and uh, the slides that are coming, but I'm very confident it will work out. So Professor Mansbridge, Jenny, a very warm welcome. Looking very much forward to your lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wish we could all be together, but uh, we have a small comfort in thinking that uh, we're helping save the planet by, by not getting on planes. Um, however, I wish we were all together and I wish I could be attending the conference and, and see you all in different workshops. Um, I want to talk today about um, something that um, I feel quite strongly about recently. Um, uh, namely the problem of our democracies being too weak to bear our burdens. Um, and now <clears throat> we're going to have a little difficulty in this talk. Move, please. Um, new, next slide, please. We're going to have a little difficulty in this talk. Next slide, please, because um, I'm used to just doing my own slides, but because of a bad connection, I have to use, um, we have to do this um, verbally, so to speak. I have to tell Patricia on the other end to move a slide. So what I'm going to talk about is, first I'm going to start with the, what I see as the crisis coming from the fact that we're going to need more and more what I call free use goods leading to a free rider problem. And then uh, because 18th century democracy is not enough, throwing out uh, three ideas. Next slide, please. 
um, and the crisis, the free rider problem, more slides, need for free use goods, more slides. And so a free use good is something that once produced, anyone can use for free, um, such as toll free roads. Next slide, please, law and order. Next slide, yep, yeah. and the stable climate. So some of those were old fashioned. Um, this is the thing, that if you can use a toll free road for free, why should you pay? If you can breathe clean air for free, why should you pay? Um, so that's the free rider problem. Next slide, please. So that logic, of course, was discovered on, in the middle of the last century. Next slide. And so I want to do how what you, some of you who heard me talk might have gone through this exercise before because I love it. Um, so we're going to do a little free rider exercise um, just to give you a sense of what the structure is. So I'm going to endow you. Yes, that's right. That's good. Go go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm going to endow you with 100 euros. And you can give me either zero or 100, nothing in between. Just that's for simplicity. And I'm going to be a doubling machine. I'm going to double everything that I get and give it back to everybody equally. No effort, effort for you at all. You're, you walk in, you give your hundred dollars, it gets doubled, you walk out with two hundred dollars. Except, um, next slide, please. Except that if you give me uh, zero dollars or zero euros, you'll get back your equal share of what everyone else gave doubled, plus you'll keep your original 100 euros. So you'll walk out 100 euros richer than everyone who stupidly gave in their, uh, their 100 euros. You'll get everything that they get back, plus you'll keep your 100 euros. So you'll be much better off. Next slide, please. So you can see that it pays you to give zero, but of course, if everybody gives zero, then you completely waste the resource of the doubling machine. And there's no trick at all to this exercise. The logic is completely clear. Um, it's just a, a logic that we, the human beings didn't understand until the middle of the last century. Next slide. So this is the poll. Um, it, oh, I say, oh my gosh, this is another, sorry. This should be a, a, a poll. Uh, somehow a, a different, can can somebody, so in, in the poll that we're going to have, yes, you can either give zero or a hundred. And it says dollars here, should be euros, I'm sorry. This, there was a little bit of a slip and in, in, in right at the big, right before this talk, we discovered that I couldn't use the slides that I was planning to use. So Anyway, what will you give? Zero, uh, zero euros or 100 euros? Decide now and make, make your choice and give. Zero, you only give zero uh, uh, euros or 100 euros. Nothing in between. Just so that we can uh, understand the logic really easily. Tell me when the... I'm looking forward to seeing what the what what percentage gives and what percentage does not give. Pat, do we have results? Yeah. I do. Yeah. Not everyone has voted, so I'll I'll put it up. That's all right. Show, show, show the results of those who did vote. Okay, so seventy percent gave. I I I I, I guessed it fairly close. Uh, let's close that and let's go on to the to the next slide, please. That's the common pool version of the free rider problem. And the, the key thing here is to think of that doubled money as a free use good. It is a free use good. Um, you benefit from it even when you haven't contributed to producing it. So the problem now, obviously, a society in which everyone gave that hundred would be a richer society than the society where no one gave that 100. In this case, 70% gave, so it'd be sort of 70% successful the society. Um, I use the words free use good, sometimes called a public good, sometimes called non-excludable good. There's some good reasons for not using those names. Um, shall we go to the next slide? So, of course, this logic leads to the underproduction of the good. Next slide. 
In other words, you don't get as much of the good as you really want. So I made a guess that about 65% of you might contribute the 100 euros and 70% of you did, which is pretty close. So now what I want to ask those of you who did give the 100, why? Why did you do it? Next slide. You could have done it out of duty, a sort of sense of I ought to contribute or you should, could have done it out of solidarity. I don't want to let the other people down. These are sort of emotional and rational considerations. Probably you and, uh, acted under a mix of both of those. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna model this as, uh, there, this is the core, next slide, please. This will have to go quickly, the next, that's the core of duty and solidarity and that's about 70% of you did that. Now, what I want to do is stop here for one second. I have asked you to think what will happen if we ran the exercise again. And if we were in, in person, I'd kind of ask people to raise their thumbs and put their thumbs down. I decided not to hassle with that um, in the, in the um, virtual presentation. But what um, laboratory experiments show is that uh, it will, in fact, unravel. That is to say, um, fewer people will give the 100 euros the second time, and even fewer the third time, and even fewer the fourth time, and so forth. And that's because the people on the edge will begin to feel, I don't want to, you know, I want to be in the group that takes away the, the 100. The 100. Um, so next slide. Um, so that what we, one way we can keep um, people giving hundred dollars is to in one way or another coerce those who don't who gave zero uh, zero euros um coerce them to have some sort of fine um or you know you could you could fine uh them more than 100 euros or there could be if if the poll were not anonymous um that number would of contributors would have gone up probably it depends on how many libertarians are in the group, but but probably people would, in normal small societies, people want to have reputations as good contributors for all sorts of reasons, um, uh, reciprocity in the next time round and so forth, uh, getting a reputation as a good person. Um, so that kind of social sanction, the scowl when you don't contribute, um, the smile when you do contribute, those, those rewards, those small social rewards, keep this core of solidarity and duty going. Um, and you could say they create a kind of ecological niche for the solidarity and duty to survive. You can think of volunteering for a committee in your own department. Um, you should do it, and that's the main reason you do do it. But if you never volunteered for any committees, not only would some of your fellow members of the department think maybe a bit less of you, but also the next time you came to ask for a raise or some sort of other favor, you might not be given quite the benefit of the doubt or given quite the, um, th there might be a little bit of sanction, to, to formal sanction in there too. So if our goal, our goal ought to be if we, uh, to increase duty and solidarity. And also when we have this coercion, uh, increase the legitimacy of that coercion. And that of course caused, some of these things cause problems for capitalism because um, you know most uh, capitalists don't like uh, being uh, regulated and coerced. Um, and uh, sometimes the duty and solidarity of a community can be turned against uh, capitalists. So that's a, just a, an aside. Uh, shall we go to the next slide, please? My big point is that the number of free rider problems within nations is going to increase in the coming years um, because we're just going to need, we, we become more interdependent. We need things like free internet and so forth. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, the number of free rider problems among nations is going to increase. Uh, for example, climate change. Uh, that's the big daddy of all free rider problems. Next slide. So my argument in short here, the first part of the talk, is um, that increasing interdependence leads to increasing numbers of free rider problems. 
which leads to increasing need for state regulation and coercion. And therefore, we're going to have to really find ways to make that state coercion more legitimate because there's already more state coercion, way, way more state coercion than our original democracies were set up to handle. And we're going to have to have more state coercion in the future. If you follow my logic and you agree with all the steps, you're going to have to agree that we're going to need more state coercion in the future. This is not a fun thing. This is not nice. This is not anything either any of us wants. So, um, but I think it's, it's actually going to happen. Um, and so we need to make that coercion increasingly legitimate. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. So my point is that 18th century is not enough for, for a lot of reasons. They had smaller constituencies. They had less concern with equality and inclusion than we do now. It was harder to travel long distances. There was less for government to do. And so they concluded, they, they didn't think of communication as a problem. You, if you read um, large numbers of classic democratic theorists, you won't see them talking much about communication. Um, you have this, a very absurd dichotomy now, um, the very absurd concept, tech trustee versus delegate. Both of those came from the fact that people had gone on stage coaches and went off to the Capitol and then and couldn't be in communication with their constituents very much. And so they either had to sort of decide for those constituents or they had to be instructed. Um, th this is fairly irrelevant now. They could have the idea that that government was best that governs least. That's wrong now. Um, that is simply incorrect. Um, it's true that we should minimize the coercion that we need, but we're going to need more and more coercion. Um, and then they had the non-delegation doctrine, which said that only legislatures should make laws and not administration, administration can set them. And that's also impossible these days. So we're in a very different world. So the 21st century uh, needs a different kind of democracy. I've got three ideas that I'm going to throw out. Um, but <laughs> the point is not just my three ideas, but getting us all thinking about what's needed. Next slide, please. First idea that I'm going to throw out is about legislative negotiation. Sacred mentioned that uh, we did a book on this. Um, and the central lesson from negotiation theory uh, is to look for the interests behind the positions. If any of you teaching in law schools or public policy schools or even business schools, you'll know that the negotiation courses are among the most popular. They're among the most popular because they're very useful. They actually teach real skills, important skills for, um, for moving forward in whatever enterprise you're in, including government. And the idea is if you can look, this is the this is one of the very biggest lessons you get out of any of these courses. And the idea is that if you can look, uh, if you can find what people want underneath their larger needs, their deeper needs, you can sometimes meet those needs at lower cost for what, from what uh, they are asking for. Next slide, please. Next slide. And that's integrative agreement and you have to ask questions to get there. And Mary Parker Follett, uh, invented this concept or discovered this concept, discovered this logic uh, in 1925. She was a woman, she didn't have an academic position, et cetera, et cetera. She was uh, somewhat famous in some business circles at the time, but basically she was uh, not remembered tremendously well. And I hope every one of you will remember her name, Mary Parker Follett. She invented the concept of integrative negotiation. Um, it's been relabeled win-win negotiation. And she, she was sitting in the library one time at Harvard um, and someone came in, this is her example. Uh, she was sitting by the window and it was kind of hot in the room and somebody came in and asked her if she would open the window uh, to get the room cooled off. Um, but you know, she had papers and she didn't want it fast. She said, well, we could have opened the window. You know, he wanted it that far up. I wanted it closed entirely. We could have opened it halfway. Um, but she suggested opening the window in the other room where there was no one to be bothered by a draft. And she called that integrative negotiation. It wasn't that he wanted the window open. It was that he wanted the room cooler. It wasn't that she wanted the window shut because she likes shut windows. She wanted no draft. So if you found out what they both wanted, 
you could think creatively of a solution that gave them both what they wanted. That's integrative negotiation. Next slide, please. So the idea that for the 21st century is how about instead of, not instead of, along with teaching negotiation to business school students and law school students and public policy students, how about we teach negotiation skills to legislators and to their high level staff? Next slide, please. So the very concept of legislative negotiation, of course, legislators negotiate all the time. Political parties negotiate all the time. It's just that this hasn't been a very great field of study. And also we haven't tried to, to make it better. So what we did was at the Kennedy School was we wrote some simulations and three and some cases that, that embodied the lessons of the sort of star cases in, in negotiation courses. Uh, up until now, the 40 years of, of negotiation work uh, leading to the present. Um, and we created legislative cases. They are all in the American context, I'm afraid. Um, but they could be easily adapted for the Euro European the context of any given country. So then we are now teaching um, legislative negotiation through the Library of Congress to high level staff, congressional staff, and to some state legislators. So, and in, in the li these Library of Congress courses are way oversubscribed. They're very, very popular. People say, this stuff works. We got bills through that we couldn't get through before taking the course. Next slide, please. So this idea is really a break from the Habermasian idea, the Rawlsian idea, other, other philosophical stances that I've opposed bargaining and deliberation. This, um, and this ne seeing negotiation, good negotiation as a, as a good, um, breaks the opposition between deliber pure deliberation where there is a, co is a common good and then that, and that it's a matter of sort of converging on it and discovering it and making everybody realize there is a common good to recognizing conflict, but finding ways of negotiating that conflict that produce greater value versus lesser value. And to do that, you have to listen hard to what, you have to ask good questions. I should, I, the more recent version of this says, ask good questions and listen hard. Um, you have to pull your, the other person out. You have to find out what's, what's underneath. Um, next slide, please. Oh, well, anyway, so that's, yes, so that's the big lesson from negotiation, and we can teach it in legislatures. If we teach in legislatures, and we negotiate more solutions that are um, ag agreed on by not just narrow majorities, but fairly large um, numbers of parties and so forth, um, that legislation is going to be more legitimate. Another um, uh, much, much used or beginning to be much more used uh, these days uh, mechanism is the civic lottery. Next slide, please. That means you draw a random selection of citizens um, and that uh, probably all of you have had some experience with one or another of these. Um, in Canada, they had citizens assemblies on voting systems, Ireland on abortion, France and Scotland, the UK on climate and so forth. And now of uh, East, East Belgium, um, is actually setting up a permanent randomly selected body, uh, a, a, a permanent, a permanent council, but then it, it's going to commission uh, randomly selected bodies on certain issues. Um, Bogota has got something called the itinerant citizen, a citizen assembly in which one um, deliberates and sets the agenda for another that decides and then another, a third one looks back and says, how did that work um, and, and evaluates. Um, so you, it, it's very much in the um, experimental stages. We've had many, many, many of these, but still every month or so, someone is, is inventing uh, little tweaks to, to the idea. Deliberative polls have been done in 27 countries. They're almost, these are almost all advisory, for, but for example, in East Belgium, it's advisory, but if the parliament doesn't, if the legislature does not accept it, they are bound by the 
law that set up these assemblies, they are bound to give a public justification for why not. So these are not making laws, but they are, um, <clears throat> but they are advising in a way that uh, is, has, has got some teeth in some cases. Next slide, please. So here I'm just looking at a deliberative poll that was done the September before last, um, uh, brought together 526 people, very expensive, $3 million, cost $3 million. Um, and these often, the, the way these often work is that people rebalance materials, they listen to experts, they, they meet in small groups, they ask questions of the experts and so forth. That's the, this is a picture of a small group right now. Next slide, please. And you see, sometimes see quite dramatic opinion change. This is an opinion change from, from uh, the, the uh, that, um, American One Room Deliberative Poll, <coughs> September before last. Um, so uh, the support for forcing undocumented Im immigrants to return to their home countries before applying to live and work in the United States fell from 79% of Republicans approved of this before the deliberative poll, but only 40% approved of it after the deliberative poll. Next slide, please. And there was some, some similar changes among Democrats. 60% um, supported a government funded baby bond for use in education or other purposes. That's the third one down there. Um, and that fell to 21% after to the discussion. The discussion was pretty much about costs. Um, and <laughs> I was in a small group and one, one woman afterwards who had been a Democrat all her life said, you know, I never really thought about these pro programs costing anything. Um, so some of the uh, some of the lack of support uh, came when the people considered cost. Now, this was a very short deliberation on each of these um, issues. And you might have seen different different outcomes if you'd had a, a longer and a longer deliberation. Next slide, please. But I think, I think and hope that in the future, civic lottery will become an important part of democracy. Um, I think it has the, the, the potential to really increase legitimacy greatly if done well. First of all, the assemblies have to be, uh, stand up to scrutiny as if they make decisions that uh, not many people, if they, if, if they advise things that many people disagree with, um, they're going to have to be, um, when, when the way the way this assembly was created is criticized, it's going to have to stand up to that criticism. So it's going to have to be representative, um, which means that you're going to have to pay uh, people because poor people will, are not likely to spend a weekend discussing something if they're not if they're not paid because they don't have that kind of time. Um, you may have to make sure that the materials are balanced and the experts are balanced. Um, you ought to have some kind of connection with people who are some kind of probably preferably um, legal connection with the people who are deciding um, so that so that those who deliberate know that their concerns are going to be taken very seriously. And you also, the, the, I'm going to add, that that's pretty much out there in the literature. Those of you who are familiar with this literature will know those. I want to add something myself, um, which is that current deliberative polls are not publicized as well as they could be. And <clears throat> when they are publicized, they're publicized in the way that I just showed you, uh, the numbers before, the numbers after usually. Um, I think it would be very good to have a, a system in which you could interview people who have been through these processes, particularly people who've changed their minds, and that would be very easy to do. You could, um, when you give the second survey at the end of the the assembly, um, you could the computer could tell you who's changed their minds from the first survey, and then you could immediately have an army of undergraduates or whatever with their iPhones. Um, going and interviewing those people on the iPhones, why did you change your mind? And then you could pick from those interviews the reasons that were the most convincing and the people who were the most convincing in 
in, in speaking their reasons. And you could try to vary those people who were speaking and giving their reasons by class, by ethnicity, and so forth, gender, various politically salient characteristics. So that people could see on the television, people like themselves explaining why they changed their minds. That hasn't been done yet, and, and I'd like to see it done. Because the goal for me is very much not only producing better decisions, it would be good to produce better decisions, no question. But the goal for me is increasing legitimacy. I see that as a crisis goal. Next slide, please. So the next, uh, the final thing that I want to throw out here is um, uh, the idea that uh, we might have as an ideal, and this is in the realm of ideals, but also in the realm of the practice that tries to live up to those ideals, something I call recursive representation, which means a relationship of representatives with their constituents that is mutually responsive, that is iterative, that's, that's recursive in the sense that I say something just not like this, this is a one-way talk, but if we were together, I'd say something, you'd say, mm, you know, maybe I disagree, or yes, you're right, or whatever it might be. That, if you said, yes, you're right, that would encourage me to say something else. And, um, but if you disagreed, then I'd consider that and I'd come back and we'd have a conversation. A dia a, it would be dialogic. It would be recursive. Now, in the past, you couldn't even imagine representatives having that kind of relationship with their constituents, um, electoral representatives. Um, and But but now you can. Um, and so I um, am arguing that we should make this a a major ideal in our representative systems. So next slide, please. So first let's look at the electoral arena. And <clears throat> no, what, go back. Oh, the electoral arena, what's the next slide? Oh, okay, great. So, me, me, <laughs> so what I meant by recursive is this business of um, listening, questioning, responding, next slide. <laughs> Sorry about this business of my not being able to control. Um, so, uh, Oh, okay, the, the footnote isn't there, but um, um, uh, Michael Neblo and his and his uh, co colleagues in in a book called um, um, "Democracy with the People: Representation with the People, Politics with the People, Politics with the People," um, uh, did an, uh, <clears throat> not just one but many experiments in which they created what they call deliberative town halls, which are on the internet. And you bring together on the internet 175 randomly selected constituents. And they had great uh, random selection. Uh, the, only, um, the only people they overrepresented were um, the unemployed and people with children under 12 in the home. And if you think of that for a second, you can realize, well, those are the people who have time and access to a laptop sort of um, and can and can spend an hour interacting with doesn't with their elected representative um, with very little cost with let lower cost. But those those aren't the worst people in the world to have overrepresented uh, the unemployed and um, people with children under twelve in the home. But you could could have you you can you can fix any problems and you can somewhat fix any problems with underrepresentation by using a stratified sample going deeper into the randomized group until you get appropriate proportions of the the uh, the the, uh, the politically relevant groups that you're interested in. So after this kind of session, uh, constituents learn a lot about the topic. These topics were big topics, immigration, terrorism, not tiny topics. They learn, they feel empowered. Um, they and the representatives also this this particular piece of the research is ongoing, seem to learn and and seem to use what they've learned to inform their policies. Now, if those two things are true, continue to be true that the representatives and the constituents learn and they have this interaction, this could be highly legitimating. Um, in the US, a representative, in the US, this is the nationals. These are national representatives, so they have huge constituencies. But if, nevertheless, if they give two sessions a week, two hours a week, of course, if they give it 52 weeks a year, they wouldn't do it at Christmas, et cetera. But, you know, after six years, they can engage a quarter of their constituents. Now, if you had that as a general phenomenon, this was be happening all the time. 
You could expect this to happen to you once or twice in your lifetime. Certainly your friends would have it happening to them, uh, your know, spouses, et cetera, et cetera. You'd be talking about it. The people who went through this experience talked to 1.5 other people about it. Uh, people would be talking about it. Schools would teach you, teach students what, how to, how, how to handle this situation. Um, it could become one, a situ could allow representatives to understand much more deeply the concerns of a broad range of their constituents and al allow constituents rightly to feel heard. Next slide, please. Next slide. So my second point is that it should be throughout the representative system. We could use, we, we should have recursive uh, representation as an ideal throughout the whole representative system, which means not just the legislature, but the administration and also what Michael Sayward has called the societal realm, uh, namely the NGOs, the whole panoply of voluntary organizations and NGOs and so forth, unions that we have developed, human beings have developed in the course of um, the last several centuries. Next slide, please. So the old model was, you know, the voter elected a representative, the representative nominated an administrator, chose an administrator, the administrator coerced the citizen. Um, and it was legitimate because each of those little arrows, it was legitimate when each of those little arrows was in fact legit. You know, in other words, the voting process was egalitarian, the elected representatives chose administrators on appropriate grounds, there wasn't any money under the table, the administrators and coerce the citizens in the appropriate legal ways. And that, that was the normative criterion for how, what, how that representative relationship should work. Now in the next slide, uh, now in the um, recursive model, we add another ideal, which is that there should be this recursivity. Um, next slide, please. Uh, um, so we want, to, we want to have recursivity throughout um, legislatures, policy making level administrations, the street level. Next slide, please. So, next slide. So, citizens would have the um, that this relationship, and this is important. Administrators would have policy um, make administrators would have this relationship. How do we do that? What about the civic lottery? The civic lottery was part, in a way, of the recursivity that Michael Nebro and his and his colleagues had this sort of randomized group of citizens who were talking with their representatives. Because representatives usually get to talk with the activists. Activists are often um, middle class or professional skills of speaking, um, but they also um, are the ones who care the most by definition. And the ones who care the most by definition don't always see the perspectives of those who don't care as much. They don't necessarily represent all the perspectives, but if you get a randomized selection, talking with administrators, for example, the uh, tex te uh, Texas put in a whole, Texas has more windmills, um, more wind power than any other state was larger, but I mean, per, 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 per population than any other state in the union. And that's because the Texas utilities commissioner commissioned a deliberative poll and asked se several of them and asked citizens a random selection would they be willing to pay a bit more on the, their utility bills in order to build these windmills and they said yes and that le legitimated the decision to build all those windmills much more than uh than if the administrator just sort of collected a bunch of experts and decided that this was best for everybody next slide please now on the street level, you also can, please go back one. On the street level, you can also have more recursivity just in simple ways like, uh, for example, if you got a ticket for speeding, along with your ticket, you could get a little piece of paper the size of the ticket that said um, that the legislature had found that um, on highways like this, uh, X number of people were killed uh, at, this num number of miles uh, uh, um, speed per kilometer um, and at a higher speed, 
more people were killed and they had decided that, you know, it was better not to kill so many people. And that's the reason. And if you had a comment, please comment here and, um, and send it into this address. Um, and that somebody would actually read those comments and actually respond and would try to work that into whatever legislation was coming next. Now, this is a very um, demanding ideal. And I mentioned in, pa I didn't mention in passing, but flashed on the screen in passing, that this is an aspirational ideal, like all democratic ideals. An ideal of equal power in democracy is an aspirational ideal. You never get absolutely, absolutely equal power for each citizen. Um, you never get absolutely equal opportunity. We never have absolute freedom, et cetera, et cetera. These are ideals that you want to aim toward, all other things considered. Um, but I'm putting the ideal on the table, that, that, this, that recursivity ought to be something. How do we build in genuine recursivity? How do we build in genuine mutuality in communication? Next slide, please. Um, so um, then, of course, we, 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 we already have a fairly robust system in which um, uh, elected representatives and administrators talk with societal representatives, members of unions, and often negotiate with them and often come up with laws, co-determination in various, but that's a very formal situation. But the EU, for example, consults widely with stakeholders. Next slide, please. Organized stakeholders, but what doesn't usually happen is that those organized stakeholders don't usually consult widely and recursively with their constituents. So the unions will make deals, and good deals, the deals that are that are the best they can get for their for their members. Um, most unions are completely above board and are doing a very good job, but they often don't. Ex explain what they've done and they often then don't, after explaining, have a forum in which their members can come back and say, well, you know, you did that, but you may not have noticed, you may not have realized that it does this to us. Um, and then the, then the union member, the union uh, administration can say, oh my God, I didn't realize that, et cetera. So recursivity is not part usually of the uh, way that many, uh, NGOs are organized, um, and especially not recursivity with random selections of the people they claim to represent. Um, they may have recursivity with a few activists, but they don't necessarily have recursivity with uh, a broad selection of those they they are represent. They not just claim to represent, but actually are representing in the current processes. And next slide, please. Just checking the time. Okay, great. We're about to come to an end. Um, <clears throat> and if you were to have that, you could even have recursivity between the constituents of these, let's say, union members and other citizens, explaining to other citizens why X, Y, Z, why the union did X, Y, Z, and why they think it's good for the larger society, and having the other citizens say, no, not, not actually. Um, and then um, somehow or other feeding that back. These are, this is the ideal. This is what I call an aspirational ideal to giving a new name to Kant's regulative ideal. An aspirational ideal, something that your obligation is not to reach, but your obligation is to strive for all things, other things considered. Next slide. So there it is, you know, <laughs> lots and lots of recursivity, recursivity, and obviously an aspirational ideal. We don't expect to achieve so anything like that, but we can try harder. Next, next slide. So that's it. Those are the three uh, ideas that I have. Next slide. Um, and any ideas you have are, are desperately are important right now. Uh, for helping bolster legitimacy. For example, um, there, <coughs> Gutenberg, Herty, uh, have got um, wonderful uh, institutes on corruption, but there's not, there's not enough attention to corruption among uh, people like us. Um, and it's a key cause of lack of legitimacy. And we all also be, need to, to work on the, getting citizens to listen to one another. But any ideas that will help bolster the legitimacy of current democracies, that's your job. 
Next slide, next slide, please. And then we'll come to the end. That's it, folks. So free use goods lead to free rider problems. Let's go to the, the whole thing. That would lead to an increasing duty and solidarity. You need to increase state coercion and you need to increase the legitimacy of that state coercion. So next slide after this, please. This is just the summary. Next slide. So that's it. That's the big takeaway. Whenever we need more free use goods, we're going to probably need more government coercion. It's a hard pill to swallow, but I think it's true. Um, so we've got to make that coercion more legitimate than the 18th century uh, allows us to make it. And your job, my job for the few remaining years in my life, um, but yours, mostly your job is to figure out how do we do this? Next slide and then we're over. So that's it. We need to think our way out of this. And thank you very much. So I hope we'll have some questions um, for the going yeah. forward. Thank you very much, Jenny. And I think it worked reasonably well under the conditions. Very no, good. No, it did. It did. It was great. That was very, very. Thank, thank you, Patricia. You. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So we have a couple of questions coming in, and I would read them out from the Q and A. Uh, before I do that, let me say I think that your lecture is also very salient and relevant. You know, in the in the COVID pandemic time, because. I mean, you could make a link towards saying, you know, governments have been in, in, this, in a position to coerce their citizens even more, you know, to impose certain lockdowns on them and so on. And as these became longer and not just exceptional situations, they, of course, raise also questions about the legitimacy of, of these actions, right? So I see the Absolutely. really important things between your, your lecture and also the overall theme of our, of our conference. So we have about, I would say, 10 minutes left. And I will, without further ado, start to read out the questions in the Q&A. And I have also seen one question in the chat. And if others would like to send in questions, please do so do, uh, using the Q&A. So if you click on the Q&A, I think you can also see them, uh, Jenny. So the first one is from Mark Cassell. There's been a global rise in authoritarianism in the US, Europe, Asia, and the global south. Do the three changes you suggest work in an authoritarian context or work when the other side embraces illiberal authoritarian values? Please, Jenny. Right. Um, authoritarians get the a need for citizens to be heard. And so um, you'll see uh, lots of uh, Putin, Putin, for example, makes a big show. Uh, he has some kind of television show in which people send in requests and, and um, people will say that I have X, Y, Z problems and he'll order some government official to take care of that problem. And, and then uh, same with a number of Latin American uh, di dictators. They uh, go to some length uh, to, um, to produce a, uh, a, a, what Mueller calls um, call a performance of what I would call recursivity. Um, uh, so they get it. Um, they they understand. In fact, populism is is many many forms of populism are based uh, anchored a little bit in a feeling of not of, of citizens not being heard um, uh, and saying I, I don't feel heard. Um, so uh, would the three changes work in an authoritarian context? Um, the uh, civic lottery. Um, will not work in an authoritarian context by and large because the authorities won't go won't won't um, won't be willing to be bound by, by be, be bound even a little bit I think by the, what the civic lottery uh, group suggests um, the, a, 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 um, a fake version of um, a version in which the the regime had its thumb on the scale uh, could well be used as a legitimating force in um, authoritarian context. And, um, but we now have enough experience with these groups so that um, though that kind of fakery could probably be pretty well e exposed. Um, 
negotiation can actually work uh, in authoritarian contexts. Um, uh, uh, dictators and so forth do negotiate to some degree with, um, with powerful uh, civil society groups. They don't like to, uh, but if the group, but it's not, it's not, um, it's, 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 it's relatively rare and it, uh, it's certainly not particularly democratic. Um, and um, recursive, well, so recursive, recursively, so, we, so that, that would be my answer to those, the, in regard to those three. Good, thank you very much. Then I take the next oh, question, question from Nancy. Nancy Di Tommaso. I remember reading about the One America experiment, but as I recall, it showed that after the three days, the participants seemed to like each other better, but no one changed their minds about candidate preferences or party identification. Hence, there may be some changes in policy preferences, but it's not clear, sorry, how that would lead to actual pol political change. Right. Well, I think that's absolutely right about the one uh, American one room experiment. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, disappointments for the organizers of that experiment was that it happened that the day that they had planned for the experiment, which took, you know, years, a year's worth of planning uh, to get 522 people in a room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera um, turned out to be a major day in one of the primaries. And the candidates decided that they were going to spend their time on with the people in the primaries and not with um not with uh the people in the american one room so that you didn't get of course you didn't get you didn't get trump, trump was not uh, willing to participate um on the republican side so you got some some opponents to trump in the trump and the, the republican primary but they were they're very smart, good people, but um, irrelevant uh, to, to people's uh, policy, to political change. Um, and on the Democratic side, you didn't get the top contenders. So that um, that particular attempt to to get to see what kinds of candidate preferences um, uh, might change uh, didn't work, but. Um, it wasn't the focus. It was really the. It was poli the, That was not the focus. The focus was um, pol policy changes, which I showed you could be quite dramatic. Now, in a much more um, drawn, much more el elaborated citizens assembly, where you took not just large numbers of these topics to see whether people's opinions changed, but a couple of topics and really walked th through them and had. Um, experts and so forth come in and have questions back and forth with experts about those few topics that, where you got deeper. Um, if you had really good publicity afterwards, I think it could lead to real political change. But that last point that I made, if you had really good publicity, is hard to accomplish. You know, television wants to to follow the most recent murder and so forth. Um, and um, that's why I think that having people speaking in their own voice would be a lot more powerful as something that children would want to put on um, than, um, than just than the numbers. And in fact, the, the Snapchat and the CNN video of American One Room are, are quite compelling for those who, who watch them. So I think we're in the experimental phase, um, but I think, I think it can, I absolutely think it can lead to real policy change. Well, it did lead to policy change in Texas and it's led to significant policy changes in uh, Mongolia and it's led to significant policy changes at various points along the line. We could talk about that later. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Next so one. for everybody in the room, we will go a few minutes over time if you can stay with us to allow uh, Jenny to answer a couple of more questions. But of course, if you have to go to other panels, feel, please feel free to. So the next question is from Ellie Okada. There is, uh, I can't read that, the citizen science involvement in the measurement of air pollutants, PM 2.5. The measurement tool is derived from the US EPA. There's a theoretical foundation in terms of management, but in democracy viewpoints, is it a wise use or has the potential uh, has the potential to, or has it the potential to lead to increasing legitimacy crisis? I wish I knew more about the measurement of air pollutions. I don't. So it's hard for me to answer that question directly. Um, 
I would say that it depends very heavily on the form of citizen involvement. Often this the citizen involvement at the moment is done by saying, we're gonna open the conference room to citizens to comment, um, you know, either virtually or um, in person. And the people who do that are the organized interest groups every so often, you know, an ordinary citizen and so forth, but you don't get, um, you don't get the, uh, the random selection. You don't get um, the kinds that you often don't get the kinds of people who, when that coercion is in fact exercised are going to say, why the heck are they doing this to me? Um, and, the, and the reasons, one of the points I, I was trying to make was in the publicity ought to focus a little bit more on the reasons for the changes of mind, rather than just the, the graphs of the changes of mind. Why is it that the citizens change their minds? Why is it, what do they give? Because coercion has to be justified. And it's, it's better justified for somebody like you than it is from some you know, representative who you feel has gotten out of touch with the citizenry or maybe comes from a different social class or ethnicity or whatever, whatever it might be, so that you dismiss what they say. Um, so you want to have reasons, you want to have the reasons given by as much as possible by, by people like you. Thank you. So there are two questions that came through the chat from Catherine Chen. So the first one is about the relation, I mean, the recursive in inclusion of NGOs. The suggestion of incorporating NGOs, unions, and other organizations is great as it leverages existing arrangements. However, how do we also balance the interest of organizations, which may or may not reflect st stakeholders in the political process, as well as who tends to be represented by such organizations? So she refers to participatory budgeting in um, NYC, where organizations were probably overrepresented in getting proposals funded, and the proposals weren't particularly innovative, partly because of the limitations placed on how funds were used. No, exactly. I think that's a tremendously important point. And um, one that many people have made, but that isn't uh, incorporated into representative theory in an absolutely standard way. And I would argue that if we expand our understanding of representation to include administration and to include the societal realm, then a lot of the questions that we've been traditionally asking over the last couple hundred years about the legislature, we're going to start asking about the representative system. And we're going to say, well, actually, how well do these voluntary organizations represent their members? And how well does the constellation of voluntary organizations, NGOs and unions and so forth, represent the citizenry? Those questions are, of course, are asked by, but they tend to be asked by people in the field of voluntary organizations. They don't tend to be asked by political theorists. They don't tend to be thought of as a problem by a political scientist who's thinking about representation. What I'm arguing is that we must start thinking systemically. We must start thinking about the, um, the way that these societal groups play, already play a huge role in the representative process but they're not subject to exactly the kind of scrutiny that you uh, bring up in your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the follow-up question from uh, Catherine was referring to equality generating mechanisms like progressive stacks, how one could integrate it. And I maybe combine, I mean, I give it back to you with another question that is uh, raised by Lucy Lehner. And I think we cannot go to all the other questions because we are running a bit of time and people are moving on to other panels. So I would say uh, this is the last one I, I, I end to you and then give you the opportunity to close up and everybody else would be invited to follow up with questions via email. If and you. also email me. I'm just Jane underscore Mansbridge at harvard.edu. So just email me. Yeah, so Lucilene is asking um, that she, she, think, she agrees that it's uh, very important uh, to ensure that state coercion is going in the right direction. At the same time, there's a great push to liberate even more uh, markets, which in a way go the other way around how to make it work right. So it's about the balance. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I don't know, um, but I do know that the lesson in negotiation is that if you look for the interests behind the positions, you can sometimes come up 
with solutions that meet more needs, not everybody's needs perfectly, et cetera, et cetera, but more needs than you would think from the opposing interests at, at, the, at the beginning of the negotiation. Um, and so, um, well, there's really two questions. One is how do you ensure sure that state coercion is going in the right direction? And that's where democracy comes in. But don't forget, um, we, the people make mistakes too. Um, and uh, democracy gives equal power, one person, one vote in theory. Um, it's not a, it, it, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have, uh, that's why we instituted rights back in the 18th century. Um, as, as constraints on democracy is because uh, we knew that we collectively don't always make the right decisions and sometimes we make very, very, very wrong decisions. So um, I would say <laughs> you can't make sure that say coercion is going in the right direction, but that democracy well organized, organized in a more deliberative way is one of the better mechanisms, probably the best mechanism we have for making sure that state coercion is likely to go in the right direction. So that's that's one part of your question. And the other is this balance. And that's where I would say negotiation is a, an important tool. Good. So thank, thank you, you very much. I realize that's the last question. I'd love to, I wish we could keep, I wish this was a more, um, you know, actual, literally, we were all together. It would be fun. But this has been great and I really appreciate it. And I do urge every anybody who wants to have a recursive uh, conversation to email me and we'll we'll continue the conversation um, online. Thank you. Yeah, I would, would really invite the two attendees whose questions I couldn't ask now to follow up by email. I'm sorry, but I think we are, have to move to, to close now because there are parallel uh, panels going on. So a very warm thank you to, Je to you, Jenny. I'm very happy that we mastered the technical. Uh, <laughs> yes, it worked really better than I feared. Such yeah. that we really could focus on the very important content of your lecture. Thank you very much for speaking, giving the lecture and for the discussion. And thank you everybody too for attending and participating in the discussion. Have a good thank evening, you. good day, wherever you are. Bye-bye.